morning again and again. Let's see if I've got sound up here. There it is. It's starting to come up. Stay. Okay. Now let's see if I got sound. Any better? Good. Hope so. Fellowship. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, we've had a little, there's a little glitchiness for some reason on these particular uh, slides. Now see it'll go through correctly, but uh, some reason it's been a little funny that way. And now somebody's got their cursor off. I'm going to have to get you to put your cursor over there where it will work for me. Uh. Uh. There it goes. That's what we're looking for. All right. All right. Um, I need to talk about this one right here, August uh, birthdays. And by the way, good morning again. And uh, glad to have you here at First Christian Church. And uh, I'm really very worried about our sanctuary uh, because uh, I think there are going to be another uh, several people coming yet this morning. And I'm pretty sure from what their habit is, they're going to sit on this side. We're already tilted. I'm pretty sure we're going to capsize. <laughs> you guys are going to have to go to work and bring some people in here. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, praise the Lord. I'm glad you all are out today, and, and, and hopefully you're enjoying the Lord's house and the day just as I am enjoying this rain. What a relief to us, and uh, looking forward to that. I want to look at birthdays for just a minute because uh, this morning when, I, uh, when the Wellen family arrived, I was given a, uh, a birthday announcement. There's a birthday in the Wellen family that we don't have listed up here. And it is Arkin. So today is, or not, when is his birthday? The 18th. The 18th. So Arkin's birthday is the 18th. We'll have to add him in there. Uh, kind of everybody that takes care of that stuff, take notes, and I'll, I'll try to take notes too. So uh, we'll look forward to that on the 18th. Um, Let's, uh, let's continue with our kind of our opening thoughts here. Our Bible study we have on Wednesday night is uh, taking a look at David. And uh, we're up to this part of his life that is about the uh, sort of a tragedy in, in the way things work out in his family. So that's going on on Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. And it's fascinating and it's uplifting even though it's tragic. And uh, I just pray that you'll uh, consider and come out and and come to know it with us our prayers we are lifting up uh, several uh, prayer concerns on a regular basis Sunday school uh, repentance and outreach today uh, I have to tell you that we had 23 in Sunday school class which is uh, great that's a, that was a tremendous improvement over last week 
And uh, I just pray that that will continue, that we'll continue to, to try to bring people in for our Sunday schools. And repentance, we need to be in prayer for repentance, that we ourselves might grow to be better Christians and that uh, the world at large, whether it's our community or whether it's our country, that we would have people who turn their minds to God and to righteousness and to kindness and honor and uh, respect for their fellow countrymen and, and community. So let's be in prayer for that. And for outreach, as we continue to try to bring our community from where they are this morning in their homes, in here, in this house, on a Sunday morning, that's what our goal is. Why? Well, not just so that we can have, we don't, you know, numbers would be okay. It's always nice to pat yourself on the back and say, well, you're doing good, you got great numbers. But my brothers and sisters that are out there in their homes this morning and are just relaxing and do not know the Lord, they're lost. And if they die, judgment awaits. And I care about that. And I want them to be saved. So let's reach them and find them and bring them that God may teach them and help them to become what they need to be. There was a free sermon right there called worship. <laughs> uh, that was a call to worship, I suppose, in a way. But I want to call you to worship further with a passage of scripture uh, that I had in mind this morning, Romans, the sixth chapter, the 12th through the 14th verses. I'm choosing it because our theme right now and what we are preaching or what I am preaching is 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, which is about the resurrection. And I thought, you know, let's find something that's, re that's about the resurrection and yet provides us some more meaning. And I find this in R Romans, the sixth chapter. This is what it says. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of, of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace. You and I who are Christians, we are going to live a life that is raised from the dead. It might have been dim and dark one time for us, but we're going to heaven now. So uh, let's lift up our eyes to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Go after him and live a life that looks like him. Uh, let's go now into our, uh, our prayer time with uh, Sharon leading us. Let's stand together, and uh, if you'll do that, Sharon, if you'll lead us in prayer, that would be awesome. Yeah, uh, like Mike said, it's really going to throw me off because now you four have to sing just as loud as this 20 over here, okay? Oh. 
Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining like the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. We sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Shining like the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to Holy, 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 I want to see you. Because you were 
amazing love how can it be to my king would die for me amazing love I know it's true it's my joy to honor Thank you, Jim. And here comes Sandy to lead us through the rest of it. And before we sing some more, we're going to do a little bit of memory work in Matthew, the 28th chapter, and the 18th through the 20th verses. So let's be looking at that. Uh, you read with me, and then we're going to stop and do this one verse. Maybe I'll be able to do it that way. If we just do this one verse, I'll be able to get it. Uh, in front of you. I can do this at home. Let's see if I can do it in front of you. It's, and Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Let's see. Let me find my little blank. There we go. And Jesus came up to, uh, spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Awesome. Let's go on and read the rest of it. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, te teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Very good. We'll pick up on the next two verses in the next two Sundays, and we'll have that memorized in just a little bit. Uh, let's continue on now. Like I'm trying to change channels, and it's not mine to change anymore. Danny, will you get us on the right path there, and we'll get ready for our song, Are You Washed in the Blood? Are You Washed in the Blood is a great song. It asks a great question, Are You Washed in the Blood? And if you're, if you're out there and you're going to yourself, yeah, I'm washed in the blood. Well, what a time of rejoicing to sing this song, uh, Are You Washed in the Blood? Let's sing together, Are You Washed in the Blood? We're going to use all four verses. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Savior. 
wonderful that you and I don't have to trust in our own, our own works to make us clean and pure, but we trust in Christ Jesus and the work that he has done on the cross on our behalf so that we can be washed in the blood, our garments can be clean and spotless. We come now to that time of memory in our service when we really take time to focus on the cross of Christ and think now what has he done for us and uh, the, the song that we have to kind of mind us that way today is at the cross and uh, it asks some good questions again and I want you to, to be a person who, who doesn't just sit there and go well you know that's a hymn and it sounds like a hymn and I'm singing it like a hymn but I actually look at the words what do the words say and do I mean them and uh, what, what do they mean to me that I might become what God wants of me? Let's sing this song as we uh, prepare our hearts and minds to gather around the table of the Lord. Alas, I did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die. Would he that sacred head for such a such as I at the cross at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my arm rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day was it thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to meet partakers in the inheritance of the saints in the light who hath de delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins <coughs> It is only through the payment God made by giving his son on the cross that we can be redeemed. We have been bought and paid for, but to us it was free. It is this free gift we remember this morning by sharing communion. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of your son. Help us celebrate him with joy in our hearts, hope in our God, love to forgive as we have been forgiven. Please fill our hearts with your love and power. Bless our work here for you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.
pray. Dear Lord, uh, we just thank you so much. And as Bob mentioned, we thank you so much for the gift of your son and all the gifts that we receive from you each and every day. And now it's our turn to give a gift back to help this church grow, to help educate everyone about God and his word. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> with me. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? Would you have him bear your burden, carry all your load? Let him have his way with me. His power can make you what you ought to be. His blood can cleanse your heart. wonderful news and true. Uh, we have uh, Phoenix Meyer to lead us in our responsive reading this morning, so 
Uh, Phoenix, if you'll make your way to the front here and take your position before the microphone so that we can hear you loud and clear, uh, we'll follow along and uh, you read the, the uh, quiet or the, the not so bold parts of the reading and we'll read the bold parts. Go ahead, Phoenix. I will bless the Lord at all times. Praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boasts boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. Will magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked to him and were radiant. Radiant. Radiant, and their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and rescues him. Them. O, o taste and see that the Lord is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear there is no want. But they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Who is the man who desires life and love, length of days that he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward, are toward the righteous. And his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evil doors to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are cursed. Church in the spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of his servants. And none of those <coughs> who take refuge in him will be condemned. Phoenix for reading that for us. Thank you, uh, uh, Sandy and Jim, for leading us in song, for all the men that helped serve communion, Bob, for providing our meditation today, and of course, our uh, folk that are working there in the sound booth appreciate their hard work for us so that we can uh, keep uh, the right thing in front of us on overhead and uh, keep our sound coming out good. Going out, I think, to Facebook to some degree, we hope, and uh, Today we're going to study again from 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Uh, I had wanted to come back to 1 Corinthians 15 in part because we just didn't get all the way through. And uh, I felt like 1 Corinthians 15 is such a strong passage of Scripture that we didn't want to leave it untreated, that we wanted to study all of it. And so I invite you this morning, if you have your Bibles to, with you, to open to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, and we'll take our reading from the 20th through the 34th verses. Now, we've treated those that are going before in the 15th chapter uh, last week, and uh, now we're going to go 20 through 34, and then in the ensuing week, we'll go uh, 35 through 58. So we want to keep our eye on this passage because there's so much good to get from it. And it's all about the resurrection uh, the resurrection of the saints, you and me, not just Jesus. It will, today's uh, passage will start with Jesus, and well it should, uh, and it will describe exactly why as we get there. Let's look at that first uh, verse that we're going to study this morning. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Paul has been talking to the, the Corinthian folk because... They had some people uh, in their midst uh, who were saying, 
outlandish things, like there is no such thing as resurrection of the dead. And uh, Paul has been at pains to tell them, look, yes, there is too. In fact, uh, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then even Jesus isn't raised from the dead. And if that's true, then you are still in your sins. Uh, so for us to, to make light of something like the resurrection plays havoc with our faith. You don't want to do that. You want to understand the resurrection, what it means, what it means to you and I. And since Jesus is raised from the dead, and in baptism I am united with him, then I am anticipating, as we mentioned in the, the uh, opening text this morning, I'm anticipating I too am raised from the dead. Jesus, according to this passage, he's just the first fruits of those who are asleep. What does that mean? Well, simply this. Jesus got up from the dead first. Oh, what about Lazarus? Well, Lazarus got up from the dead, yeah, but he went back to the dead after he got up for a while. Jesus got up from the dead forever and lives with God forever. And he's returning to take us home with him. You and I will be raised from the dead uh, at, the, at the very latest when Jesus returns. If we've died, we may not even get there. It may be that Jesus steps through the sky today before I finish uh, the next sentence. He may be here. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. You and I need to understand that Jesus was first, and because we're in him, we're following him. Just as the body follows the head, we're following Christ into the resurrection. We'll be made anew. For since by a man came death, goes on Paul, uh, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. If you believe the first part of your Bible, you need to be believing the last part of your Bible. If you believe the part where Adam uh, was the, the person, Adam and Eve, they fell into sin, and uh, as a result, all of mankind followed suit they all fall, fell into sin. Well, we got introduced to, the, to sin and to death by one man, by Jesus. By one man, we are introduced to resurrection from the dead. So there's a certain uh, balance or uh, fitting way in which this all balances out in the, in the course of human events and those things that have happened. Uh, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Continues to work on this balance. Adam, Christ. Adam, Christ. Adam, in Adam we die, in Christ we're made alive. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, after that, those who are Christ's at his coming. So, uh, Christ, the first fruits, after that, who are Christ at his coming. So we're going to be raised from the dead. Um, I don't know how many of you are to pay attention. One of the things I had to pay attention to uh, when I was a Bible student and I was studying to be a preacher, we looked at, uh, at cemeteries. And I don't know, not all cemeteries are laid out this way, but most are. And where you put the headstone is at the west end of the grave, so that the, the corpse, as it were, is facing east, looking for the coming of Christ when he comes through the eastern sky. I think that's very appropriate. I think it's wonderful. Do I think that those people will actually see Jesus any sooner than the guys that are pointing the other direction? No. But for us, the living, it's a great reminder. It's a great reflection in what we do with ourselves that looks forward to this resurrected life. This anticipation of a reality that is yet to be. Somebody asked me today, 
isn't it hard to love your enemies? And I said, yeah, it's hard to love your enemies. It's hard to pray for them. But you and I, we can get power out of the resurrection for doing exactly that kind of thing. Because we know what the end is. We know how bad it's going to be for people who don't turn to Christ, who have turned their back on him now and are, are hateful and awful towards him now. Our, our answer cannot be, should not be in Christ Jesus. It cannot be, well, then let them go to hell and rot. That can't be. That can't be our attitude. It has to be. Instead, where our enemy is involved, we have to be saying, oh, Lord, please turn their mind and their heart to, to yourself. Give them a chance to know you before it's everlasting too late. It's very important for us to get that and to, and to uh, let the resurrection empower us. That's not the only thing the resurrection empowers us for, is it? Shouldn't be. We're living a resurrected life. We're living a life that we're glad to be in, and we're glad to be happy in Christ all the time. So that takes out a lot of other stuff that we might, out of habit or lustfulness, greediness, we might put in there. We have to learn to live a new life in Christ Jesus. Then comes the end. Let's back up just a minute. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that, those who are Christ that is coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abol abolished is death. So you and I are looking towards a time when God's going to sum everything up. You and I are looking forward to, Jesus has already sort of popped through as it is. He's, he's already in that resurrection land. He's with God eternally now. But he will be returning, and when he does, all of us will go over. Whether we're living or dead, we'll all go over. He had, and then it says, then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. And I want you to remember that. Read it again. When he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. Isn't it wonderful that we also have the statement in our memory verse where Jesus, uh, after he comes up to the disciples, he says to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. See, Jesus is in charge. Now, I, I have to say, that doesn't mean that everything that happens is done because he points it out and says, have it done. Not at all. But you need to understand that Jesus alone is worthy to rule. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Philippians 2. When he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power. Jesus, when he comes back, kings, princes, dignitaries, whatever they are, movie stars, I don't care who they are, people that you would probably go, if you, if you shook their hand, you know, you would say, gosh, I got to shake the hand of so-and-so. You think that now. But when Jesus returns, that guy, that gal may be standing right next to you and you're going to realize they're in no better shape than you are. They're exactly the same. It's all level. There aren't any special people. All authority and all rule and all power is abolished because Jesus will be finally and completely properly recognized for who he is. For he must reign, it says, until he has put all his enemies under his feet, the last enemy that will be abolished is death. i got to back up and read that again. He must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Jesus is reigning even now. When I go out into the community and when I start working with 
you or I start working with a, a, a person who's just decided, hey, I want to be a Christian. I want to learn to live after Jesus Christ. I want him to wash away my sins. I want heaven as my home. When I'm working with that person, the thing that is happening right then, while we're working, while you and I are working, the thing that is happening right now is verse 25. He is putting underneath his feet all his enemies. Anything that you and I have that, that we're trying to hang on to and let that run our lives, our, our goal as Christians is to let, let go of that. Let it be gone. Get on top of it. Let Jesus be Christ. Let him be the Lord in our lives. That's what we want to do. And in that respect, Jesus is already putting his enemies under his feet. He's been doing it for years. Millions and millions of people now belong to Jesus. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. At last, when the, when the end comes, then death is going to be gone. How? Oh. Now you've asked me a question I don't know. Not exactly, anyway. I just know that you go, you and I go to a, a being that lasts forever. And I'm looking forward to that. Death doesn't come into it anymore. Right now, death is always there. And the, the longer you live, the more it is there. The longer you live, the more people you know that have died. But one day... Death won't come into it. It won't matter. It'll be gone. It'll be history. And you won't think about it any longer. For he has put all things in subjection under his feet. That is, even death is under the feet of Christ. And if you don't know that kind of by resurrection, I'm not sure what would show it to you. Uh, because obviously, if Jesus can suffer and die, be dead, buried, and in the grave, and then get up, Walk away from the grave. He's overcome death. It says, but when he says all things are put in subjection, it is evident that he is accepted who put all things in subjection to him. In other words, Paul's basically saying, uh, I don't want you to get the wrong impression about Jesus that somehow or another God himself will be put in subjection. No, I don't mean that, Paul is saying. No, in fact, what I do mean is that God is the author of this whole thing. God is the, the designer of the whole uh, uh, system. And, and God is going to be the one who puts in subjection all things under Christ. Uh, I, again, I, I don't want to uh, get this stale in, the, in, this, in this sermon. I don't want to get it too boring. But I do want you to be thinking about how God moves in us. He moves in us through Jesus Christ as we know him, as we think about him, as we are filled with faith towards him, then it is God who is making that happen. His spirit in us is teaching us these things and we follow Christ because of him. When all things are subjected to him, when the son himself, then the son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him so that God may be all in all. It will become clear how things are arranged when we're in heaven. Now we know just a little bit. We know enough to say that Jesus is God's son. We know enough to say that Jesus, uh, that God was in Jesus Christ, uh, 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 making the world uh, available to him or reconciling the world to himself. We can see all of those things. Well, one day we'll see that so very clearly and it'll all make tremendous sense that day when Christ himself is also subjected under God and we see that so that God may be all in all. He goes on, but Paul is still working on in spite of these wonderful theological kinds of elements in his uh, writing here, he's actually still working on a basic argument. His argument is, look it, Christ was raised from the dead. Resurrection is a real thing. You need to get your head wrapped around that and start walking that way. And this is what he says. 
He's trying to argue this again with people. He's saying, otherwise, what will those who do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Well, we don't do this now. I'm not aware that in the Christian churches that this is done. There is a, a, a faith that does this, but we don't. We're not baptized for the dead. But if I look at that, and I realize that back in Paul's day, he could write this with some power and some uh, persuasion that is, in fact, that there were people who were doing this. I don't think Paul was saying, you ought to do this. In fact, if anything, he's kind of saying, well, I don't know if this is really right for people to do, but this is what they do. And if they do this, why are they doing it if there's no resurrection from the dead? Why are they bothering to baptize? And why are they bothering to baptize for the dead if there's no resurrection from it? That would be stupid. I don't give rise to two very positive, powerful things that you need to look at. And one is the resurrection. That is, hey, if that's what people believed and thought, then resurrection played an uppermost part in their mind. Another thing that played an uppermost part in their mind was baptism. So keep those things in uppermost in your mind that, that we realize that God wants us to move along in those ways, that we are baptized, we're going to be raised from the dead. Why are we also in danger every hour? In other words, why do I submit myself to danger in trying to teach other people about Christ Jesus? I, I also am going to do this. I'll do it. You, you may think that, well, you, you, don't, you don't really do it like Paul. No, you're right. I don't do it like Paul. But I am aware of the of the agencies and the, the people in the world today who want you to stand down and not condemn sin. There are certain kinds of sins they want you to not condemn. They want to be able to have a lifestyle that, according to the Bible, is sinful. And if I stand up and say, yes, it is sinful, along with the Bible, in spite of their opinion, in spite of their teaching, in spite of all of the, the help that they have from the media, I begin to risk something. And I don't know how far it will be pushed, but I do know uh, that there are places in the, in the world right now, even here in the Western Hemisphere, where you can get arrested for saying that homosexuality, that practicing that is actually sinful. Not here in the United States yet, but in this, in this hemisphere. So... You need to realize that when you and I go preaching God and his rule and his way in the world, you are putting yourself at risk. The Apostle Paul did. In fact, he put himself at risk so much that he said that he has faced lions. And other Christians certainly did in that age. They faced lions for their faith. That is, they went into the arena and the lions ate them. Let me be clear about what happened to them. Why would I allow myself to be eaten by a lion? Why wouldn't I just retract my faith, stand down, say, say I was sorry I'd made a mistake? If there's no resurrection from the dead. If there's no resurrection from the dead, my life is so precious, there's nothing I can die for. I must live. But no, since there is resurrection from the dead, it's not that my life is, is somehow or another cheap, but I can certainly give it for something because I know that I will be raised from the dead. God has that. He's got it covered. I affirm, brethren, says Paul, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. Paul knows that the life he lives is a risky life. It's a life that could get him killed any day. And he continues to do it because of resurrection. He says, if from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, 
what does it profit me? Okay, Paul somehow uh, was in an arena apparently and dealt with wild beasts and escaped. I don't know how. Sometimes they did. There's a, you know, you and I, we, we give this sign a lot to, to the situation. We say, oh, yeah, that's, that's cool, or, or thumbs up to it. I use it a lot. It comes from being in the arena when uh, somebody had watched a particular gladiator, somebody who was fighting, or somebody who was in, in danger of the lions, and they liked the way they behaved themselves, and they liked the way uh, they were brave and everything, and uh, uh, the, uh, the host of the arena would uh, give the question out, and people would either go like this for letting him live, or they would go like this for letting him die. Apparently, Paul got the thumbs up. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. In other words, let's get as much pleasure out of this life as we can. At any cost and every cost, let's just live our lives and be full of delight in everything we do. And if it costs us our integrity, who cares? We're going to enjoy life. Paul says, don't be deceived. Bad company produces corrupts bad, good morals. Bad company corrupts good morals. Don't be deceived. Don't walk with the enemies of the faith. Don't, don't give them uh, the pearls that are yours and act like they can just trample all over them and that's okay with you. Stand up. Many of you have and do. And I'm praising the Lord for that. Don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. If you want to live a life that's strong, if you want to live a life that's good, if you want to live a life that cares for other people, if you want to live a life that has integrity, if you want to live a, a life that is, is certain that, that uh, there's great meaning and morality and worthiness to being a human being, if that's the life you want to live, hang out with people like that. Because they'll help you. Others who have a negative mindset that just tear everything down and act as if it's unimportant, friends, they'll destroy you if you hang around them long enough. Learn to be a witness and step away. Be sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning, Paul says right here, for some have no knowledge of God, and I speak this to you shame. In other words, when you and I, when we become Christians, this is one of the things I don't get about some people that are just kind of like on top of this grace thing, and they come to the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're baptized into him, and they're lifted up out of that watery grave, and, you know, the next week they're out back doing the same thing. Why? Why did you bother? What difference does it make? Man, I, I come to God to be cleansed from my sins. I want to, and, and if, if I find myself sinful again, it's, it's against the work of the Spirit that's in me. And I'll just have to repent again. Because I love Him and He loves me. And I praise him for his faithfulness and his patience in me to get it right. Let's step away from it. Let's stop, as Paul says, let's stop sinning. Become sober-minded. Don't be deceived into the drunkenness that has to be uh, carried away all the time by the things that are in the world. Let's stop sinning. Be sober-minded. Some have no knowledge of God. What does that mean? I think it means this very simply. You and I walk around, hopefully, with the idea that God has made the world and everything that's in it and that He is the one who's, who's got a kind of a, a, not necessarily a rule book exactly, but a way that things ought to be and the way that He intended for life to be lived. We understand that. 
If we're following him, if we're living, living decent in Christ Jesus, we get that. That's what we're after. But some people don't even have any knowledge of God like that. They never stop to think. And as a result, they just go and do whatever they want, whenever they want, however, and as often, and make all the excuses in the world for it. God is, and he's made the world a specific way, and he wants you and I to live a specific life that is after him. Learn it and live it. As I come to the end of the sermon today, because I really am right there at the end, uh, I love this way this chapter finishes out, and so I'm using this uh, passage again. I used it last week to finish, and I'll use it again next week because it's just a great verse. If you, if you want to memorize a verse, there's a great one to, to memorize. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable in the Lord, abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. You and I, if we're going to live, we might as well just keep on living in the Lord. Um, a guy that I know used to talk about money and, and offering, and I don't usually talk much about offering, but I always like what he said about offering. That for him... The money question in his life, it wasn't about how much he had or how much that he had uh, gotten hold of and could hold on to and had in his life now. It's how much he had sent on ahead. It's how much he'd sort of given up so that it was on beyond now and in the next life. And when you and I work in the Lord, when we do things that we wouldn't normally do because the Lord Jesus is in us, that's what we're doing. We're abounding in the work of the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, the promise of the resurrection is that that kind of thinking is not empty. It's not vain. It's truthful. So, Take that seriously. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your toil's not in vain in the Lord. If today there is somebody out here who, who doesn't understand or hasn't until this morning maybe, or hasn't come to terms with it, that resurrection is a real thing, and that it's going to happen, and that finally and at last you've decided, I want to be on the side of things that when I'm raised from the dead, I'll be, belong to Christ Jesus so that I can live eternally with him. If you need your sins washed away today, if you want that peace in Christ that comes because you've allowed him to do his work in you, why don't you make that happen today? Come here to the front row as we sing our song of invitation, and we'll talk for a moment. I'll ask you whether you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. If you do, if you're ready to live after him, I'll uh, conduct a baptism for you, baptizing you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then you can go and live in Christ, and we will help you to do that uh, here in this church. We'd be glad to. Stand with me. If you have a decision like that to make for Christ Jesus, please come as we sing. is tenderly calling the home calling today calling today why from the sunshine above will thou roam father and mother away calling today calling today Jesus
bless you and protect you. Give your, your mind his spirit as you go through the week ahead. We're going to uh, bow now and pray together as we're dismissed. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the love that you've bestowed upon us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we do pray for those. We notice uh, Tracy Smith supposed to read, lead the prayer just now. and uh, Of course, she's not with us. We know that she uh, has an illness and so does uh, some of her family, Lord. And we just pray for them and ask you to, to tend to them and help them to, to get up uh, from their their affliction soon and uh, to be back amongst us. We pray, Father, that you would be with us now as we go from this house. Help us to keep our eye on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him did not, uh, did not put aside the cross, but despising the shame, he just went ahead and died for us anyway uh, because he, he wanted us. I pray, Father, that you would help us to see that, to know it, and to walk in it moment by moment. In Jesus' name, amen.